Finite element modeling and computational fluid dynamics is going to be our next topic in this video. And uh, first we talk about purpose and uses, then uh, about dynamic systems, the finite element method itself, and uh, meshing. First of all, to, to put things into context, uh, this is your engineering workflow for a lot of different things, but let's focus on lab on the chip type devices. You start with specifications customer or your supervisor, whoever uh, gives you a list of things that your system must do. Then you make a design, then you make a prototype, and then this is where, where, uh, where you can uh, deviate a little bit. You can either test or you can simulate or you can do both. Uh, we will see uh, what's for what. This diagram is a little weird, yes. Uh, I just had to squeeze it all together in one slide. Obviously, this is not how it should be drawn. But uh, after each step, you need to do a compliance test. And uh, this would be your uh, feasibility stage where you test uh, some, uh, some concepts, some uh, ideas, uh, how they work. And then you move on to the design evolution phase where um, in rapid iteration, you test uh, uh, small changes in your geometry and observe the effect. So uh, largely different uh, ideas can be tested in the feasibility phase to pick the best one and then narrow down by uh, iterating um, uh, small changes to the geometry either with simulation or with testing or both. Uh, and here's where rapid prototyping plays a, a large part uh, in both of these uh, stages. If you make an error then in the feasibility stage where you have one, two, three uh, different prototypes, it's quite cheap uh, to correct an error. In the concept stage where uh, you might want to move on to, to the material that you actually want to use in your device, making an error costs a lot more. Think about uh, injection molding, for instance, if you would like to, to do injection molding, then, uh, then making an error will cost you from 10,000 to 100,000. Whereas if you are finished with the rapid evolution of your design and you narrow down to a final design, it goes to production. In that case, making an error is really expensive. It can go to hundreds of thousands of uh, euros to collect it because you start producing, you make uh, tens of thousands of devices and then you realize that something is wrong that is a nightmare. So it's very important to do this right. And simulation is a tool for that. Rapid prototyping is another tool. You will learn about both of them in this uh, course. Uh, so what can you, you do with simulation? And why is it such a powerful tool? And let me say, here's a disclaimer. Uh, simulation by itself is rarely enough. Um, you must always relate your properties, your parameters, your results to reality. So whatever model you make, it must have a connection to, to physical measurements. Otherwise, uh, it is very difficult to claim the validity of, uh, of your simulation results. There are only a few uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, applications where a simulation is so widely used and so well validated that uh, you can immediately claim simulation results to be valid. So you can use simulations for extrapolation. If you have a prototype and you have a, a fine-tuned, and by fine-tuned I mean you have plugged in physical parameters or you have compared your first results favorably to a physical system, and you want to change the geometry and you want to see what that does, then you can simulate the new geometry and save time and money on that uh, rather than to prototype you can simulate. Interpolation. I myself use this the most often and uh, I think this is the safest to do. If you have a prototype and this prototype is already characterized by experiments and it doesn't work or you want to gain more information than you can with uh, your sensors, because for instance, your sensor doesn't fit inside your channels. 
you have a reactor like this and you cannot put a temperature sensor everywhere in your channel, you can put it only in one place, then you can interpolate from uh, measurement results and, uh, and you can get uh, more information from a simulation model. So you, uh, you measure inside your simulation model at the exact same spot as you measure in your physical model with your actual sensor and if the two values are similar to each other or they are the same then you know your model is valid and you can look at the other things inside your model. You can also call this extrapolation if you want but uh, to me it qualifies as an interpolation looking uh, uh, deeper into, uh, into a system which is already measured and as already known. And uh, example three would be uh, in silico verification where um, you have an idea but it cannot be built or you need to scale it down then you can simulate and, uh, and test your concept before it is manufactured and even though it will not be an exact mapping so it will not behave exactly in reality as it does in simulation you can observe the trends so for instance we want to construct a new uh, lab on a chip type system where liquid is being heated for nucleic acid amplification happened recently in my company work where we would like to know if uh, certain layers of certain materials are viable question was can we put the heater above instead of below with uh, a defined uh, layer of uh, materials we have worked with a device similar to this before uh, with the, the, the geometry that we have worked be with before but changing out the materials, changing the layer thicknesses and putting the heater on the opposite side as to where it was before it can be simulated and from the simulation we could determine whether it was possible to have um, a plastic in between the heater and the reaction chamber or we needed a metal instead to have a good heat conduction that you can get it will not tell you exactly how much the temperature will be but it can tell you that in relation to plastic how much better metal is and then you can make a decision based on this so summarily it can be faster and cheaper to simulate but mostly faster but you know time is money right so let's move on to dynamic systems and uh, I would like to start with this uh, quote from uh, or quote from uh, Galilei uh, philosophy is written in this uh, grand book the universe it is written in the language of mathematics so that is why we talk so much about uh, mathematics even though I myself am not a mathematician not a physician a physicist I'm an engineer but I must still understand uh, the principles behind and so do you if you would like to simulate um, fluid mechanics then it is important that you know why the model does what it does and if something goes wrong then you will be able to to intervene so dynamic systems or dynamical systems are explained by differential equations more more specifically wave equations where there is a wave coming from a source going towards a sink it always happens like this whether you talk about mechanical wave whether you talk about an electromagnetic wave it always goes like this that is what these equations uh, describe and down here that's exactly what we have it's a wave equation and uh, here we have uh, a time derivative in this case it's a time derivative of uh, flow velocity and uh, we have a spatial derivative of, uh, of a scalar function so spatial means uh, in terms of uh, spatial coordinates we use Cartesian coordinates x, y, z that was defined already in the, the first lecture and so you must uh, derivate for every spatial coordinate in this case there's only three and then you must also derivate for time to uh, describe your dynamic system and uh, yeah, just as a reminder, nabla operator means uh, differentiation 
for all the spatial coordinates, so derivation, differentiation mean the same thing for all the spatial coordinates, and Laplacian is just the square of the, the Nobla operator. So what, what's a dynamic system like? This one is a, a blood pressure curve. It's, it's a dynamic system. Anything in your body is basically a dynamic system. So in this case, uh, it is a time-dependent um, uh, system where uh, the peripheral blood pressure varies over time. So uh, yeah, this everyone knows probably what, why this picture is here uh, or where, which movie this is from. Uh, the equations describing our reality are wave equations, many of them at least, uh, or, or in a large part, wave equations are what describe your reality. So knowing these wave equations can help you to see reality as uh, Neo sees uh, reality, his reality at the end of, uh, of a Matrix movie. Uh, when we talk about uh, simulations, when we talk about fluidics, uh, everything is a spatio-temporal problem. It is related to space and time. And, uh, but you can cross out the time variable if you work with a, a stationary simulation. Stationary means that you're only looking at the steady state. So after everything has settled, um, like say you start a pump, there is a transitionary period where uh, it uh, reaches the, the plateau of your flow rate. Um, and it becomes stationary. So over time, it does not change. In that case, it is only space dependent. But most of the problems that we talk about are time dependent. For instance, uh, temperature control, which I will get to many times because that's what I did the most. Um, so this one is just a, a temperature control uh, simulation. And uh, and it shows the variation of uh, reaction chamber temperature over time. Whereas this one shows you a spatial variation of uh, temperature inside your reactor. So at every spatial coordinate, you have a different temperature inside this uh, system. So space dependent variables, time dependent variables and constants are what we have in these equations. If you look at the heat transfer equation, it's a good example. So you have space dependence, time dependence, constants, space dependence, once again. And uh, also, hopefully you know this from other courses, uh, ODs are ordinary differential equations, PDs are partial differential equations. We will typically work with partial differential equations. And we're not going to do any calculations. For that, you have software that can do it, and you have a computer that can do it with numerical uh, simulations, and, and uh, it can crunch the numbers. You don't have to do it on paper, not in this course. Uh, you have probably other courses where you had to do it. So a uh, finite element method, uh, this is only about understanding what is behind uh, your, your models to, to give you a head start. Uh, numerical methods can approximate the solution of, uh, of differential equations. And one example would be the Euler method, which uh, we have here as a simple example. So this is for solving an ordinary differential equation. And what you do is you have some sort of model. It's a three-dimensional uh, model. You discretize it into uh, steps of a certain size. Each of, this, uh, of these uh, steps, you will call them later mesh elements, each of these steps is of the same size or they are of a roughly uniform size. And, uh, but for this simple example, they will be of the exact same size. H will be our step size. And you will have a bunch of elements with this step size. And then um, you take your solution from the previous step and from the next step. And that's how you reach your, uh, your calculated uh, solution. So the way this wave equation spreads is, let's say, here's your source, here's your sink. 
from the source to sync, you must calculate the result for every single step and then for the next step and take the difference and divide it by the step size. So basically, solution at one point, solution at the next point, divided by the step size is your Euler method. And um, finite element modeling, or, or often called finite element analysis, is a numerical method for solving complex engineering and physics problems where an analytical, which means an exact uh, solution, is not possible. This requires large computational power, so that is why uh, it was only possible after the microelectronics revolution to even do this with uh, digital computers, second half of the last century, and that is how weather forecasting became a thing of our everyday life, because we could finally solve it. The um, Navier-Stokes equation has been available for roughly 200 years, but it was not possible to solve it on paper. But then computers came, and then it became, if not easy, then at least possible to solve. Nowadays you can solve it on your computer uh, with a with lot more complexity than, uh, than back when. Um, so what you have, this is your 3D system. In this case, it's a heatsink for a computer uh, processor, so for a CPU. And uh, your system is defined, or your process is defined by initial values. So where your system starts from, for instance, for temperature, this would be the ambient, 25 degrees Celsius, or whatever it is. And you have boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are the interfaces between the different domains of uh, your model, or the interface with what's outside of your model. So, for instance, we have a constant temperature uh, defined for the CPU. Let it be 80 degrees Celsius. That is this boundary, uh, and the boundary condition for this boundary. Then we have uh, convective heat transfer. And uh, on various sides, we have uh, convective heat transfer to the external uh, ambient. And so, also the physics problem is defined uh, through uh, various uh, partial differential equations for the domains in your model. So, in this case, the heatsink is one domain, but in the other case, you have uh, a domain of metal and you have a domain of air uh, uh, working together in a conjugate heat transfer problem. And Mesh generation, so again, remember, we cut our model into uh, uh, finite step sizes uh, or finite elements of a certain step size. Uh, this is your mesh, and you generate the mesh by cutting up, by discretizing your problem to a finite number of uh, one to three dimensional mesh elements. Uh, the, the distribution defined or the size defined by the, the mesh size or the element size. And then the model is solved by a solver program. Uh, so to talk more about the meshing, why is this critical? The reason why it is critical is because you have interfaces inside your model between the different domains. So if we look at, uh, for instance, this uh, simulation on, uh, on a joint, I mean a joint in your leg or your arm, uh, then you have different domains so uh, cartilage, bone, and how they interact in this mechanical model, those are the interfaces. Interface between cartilage and bone, that's the critical thing. What happens over there is what determines your result and the quality of your model. In the case of fluidics, what happens near the boundaries, the, the walls or the, the boundaries between your fluids, such as in a droplet flow, uh, where the boundary is the boundary of the droplet interacting with the, the fluid uh, surrounding it or, or with the next droplet. This is what's important and this is what you must calculate with the smallest uh, step size that your computer can work with. Because uh, if you take a too large step size, then your boundary will not be very crisp. It will be a diffuse uh, thing. You will not be able to determine where it is. 
so you must work with a small enough mesh. This is the art of meshing. And you have to have as fine a mesh as possible because interfaces will otherwise be misrepresented and if you have a too coarse mesh you will get a very large error or you will get artifacts or you will get uh, numerical explosions, divergence. You will not get to a solution. But if you apply a, a too dense mesh then you will run out of memory and it will also take tons of time to solve it. So what you see here is uh, in one of my models that you saw on the previous slide. If you go with a higher mesh density, then your RAM usage immediately increases several times. And the solution time of your model, so the time it takes to arrive to a solution, also increases a lot. But what you can do is cut your model in half. So cut along the axis of symmetry. Like here, I could cut and only simulate this part and, and just uh, mirror uh, along the symmetry. And you must also remove any uh, unnecessary feature, so screws, um, electrical contacts, even the, the channel walls do not have to be in your model. Anything that you can remove, you should remove, whichever does not take away from um, the simulation itself. So whatever doesn't destroy your result uh, should be removed. So in this uh, first slideshow on, uh, on finite element modeling and, uh, and computational fluid dynamics, I talked about purpose and uses, dynamic systems, finite element modeling, and meshing, or the finite element method and meshing. Thank <music> you.